of wearing it. It was perfect up to about oh, 80 miles from Floesti. And we ran into this terrific weather front. And uh, we'd been told by the British not to go below 10,000 feet that the Germans had barrage balloons up to that height. Oh. And we we were flying at something like 26,000. Wow. And so we let down, and when I thought we were over Ploesti, we managed to break out of the clouds about 10,500 feet, and we were smack over Bucharest, the capital of Romania, ah. and uh, which was about 60 miles, I think, south of Ploesti. And uh, we looked to the north where Ploesti was, and that was completely socked in. And we were flying over Bucharest, and we we uh, saw some railroad yards down there that looked like they had some oil tankers in. And everybody on the crew, we were talking about, are we at war with Romania? Uh-huh. And nobody knew. <laughs> and to this day, I don't know. So did you bomb, them, you bomb the marshalling yards? No, we didn't. It, oh. was, it was such a pretty city, uh, wide avenues and everything, and the pilot left it up to me, and I thought, well, let's, uh, there's supposed to be several near, uh, small refineries near there. Let's try to find one of those. So we did, and we found one and did a little damage, I think, to it. But it was the weather snafu'd ah. the mission. It it. I think it was a complete surprise to the Germans. They didn't think the English could fly that far, or we could either, or would come way up into Romania. Huh. But well, I'm getting ahead of my story. That's okay. Now, you were you were part of Jim Seepert's crew, correct? Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, I was going to say uh, how, how PRO was formed. It was a project that I think... Uh, General Arnold and entrusted to Colonel Halverson. Correct. And, and he got his pick of the best personnel from the 98th Bomb Group, which was in Barksdale. Yes. He, he got the best pilots. He got the best maintenance men. In fact, there was quite a bit of friction, I think, between Colonel Halverson and the CO of the 98th. And that but carried over when you got to over, actually got over to North Africa when they joined up. Yes. You, you, right, yes. And uh, Colonel Alverson, really, he got all oh, the best engineering officers and a bomb site expert. And one of the uh, engineers was a major Nero. Who, Ulysses S. Nero, yes. Who was uh, rumored to be with Billy Mitchell. Yes. Uh, uh, he was quite old, I guess. He was 65, 70 years old. And uh, so and he, we got the best equipment. They took us, flew to Wright Field, and we got the best equipment you could get. And uh, it was really almost a self-contained unit. And we took off from... Uh, after, um, can you hear me? Yes. Are you are you getting this, Rob? Uh, yes, I am. Okay. I can hardly hear you all. Well, go ahead. Just just keep talking. I I'm hearing you perfectly. Uh huh. Oh, all right. Um, we were training. Uh, we met at Fort Myers, Florida, uh, and the we had just graduated from uh, Celestial Navigation School. In March 31st, and were commissioned second lieutenants on April 1st and reported the top 20% of the navigation class reported to Fort Myers, where Colonel Halverson was forming his uh, crew. Now, is that the first time you met Colonel yes. Halverson? Yes, that's the first time. Okay. And uh, we helped really to open the air base at Fort Myers because all they had there then were a couple tents for operations. And uh, we trained there for about four weeks. This was in uh, April. 
and uh, they did not have any bombardiers. There were none available. Actually, there was a more a shortage of navigators and bombardiers than there was were pilots at the beginning of the war. Uh-huh. Uh huh. So uh, they gave us uh, flew the navigators to Eglin Field in uh, Florida, which I think is near Pensacola. Right. And we took some. Uh, they had link trainers mounted on a. Oh, six-foot platform with a Sperry or a Norden bomb site, I've forgotten which, mounted, and a plumb bob to drop when you were uh, near the target. And you actually flew the, uh, or uh, guided the uh, link trainer, and it was a simulated bombing attack. You were actually controlling the link trainer, which the bombardier does when he takes over the, on the bombing run. Right. And we uh, we had three or four days of that. And one one day uh, we flew out of an A-20, which I believe is a attack bomber, and and nothing like a B-24. And that's all the training that uh, we had in bombing. Ah, okay. Uh, it was really uh, not enough. Uh, some guys were forgetting to open the bomb bay doors when huh. you're on a bombing run and uh, things which would come natural if you'd had more training. Right. But anyway, we did a pretty fair job, I think. But... Uh, and we finished our training on in uh, Fort Myers around the first uh, of May, and we took off for uh, uh, left Morrison Field in Florida and flew to Natal, Bra Natal Brazil, and from Natal Brazil we crossed the Atlantic to Accra. In Africa, and from Africa we flew to Khartoum, which is was then in the Anglo-Egyptian Sudan. I don't know whether what country it's in now. Sure. But anyway, it's where the uh, White Nile and the Blue Nile formed to flow into Egypt, and we were uh, staying there for two or three days for a group to get together because it, we didn't fly in any formation. We were individual flights to get to Khartoum. Now, were you in the and first group? Were I you in the first? remember Khartoum being so very hot. Everything was white, the clothing, the buildings, and everything. And it got up to, one of the days, 125 degrees. Oh, oh my, my gosh. gosh. And uh, so we were there for about three or four days, and we found out... Uh, just before we left the States, we were issued a lot of maps with China and Japan. And that was the first inkling we had that we were going to be go to advanced bases in China and bomb Japan, which was sort of a follow-up to Doolittle's raid from the sea. Right. And during, at, while we were at Khartoum, uh, getting the group together, the, we got word that the Japanese had overrun the Chinese base that we were going to go to, which meant we didn't have a place to go, we didn't have any bombs, we didn't have any place to get gas, so we waited there, and about the same time, the uh, Rommel and his Africa Corps had defeated the British around Brook in a tank battle and knocked out uh, presumably about 300, 250 of the British tanks, and they only had 300 in the Middle East. So they were afraid of lo losing the Suez Canal because Rama was starting his advance. And uh, so they decided maybe we'd better stay, go back to the uh, 
RAF base on the Suez Canal called Fayed. Right. And operate from there. And that's where we took off from Fayed to go to, go to the uh, mission in uh, Floesti. Our next mission uh, from Fayed was uh, Malta. The island of Malta was so important to the British. They got a lot of information of shipping of supplies from Naples and Greece and all to the uh, uh, Rommel's troops in Africa. And Malta was able to uh, provide uh, British intelligence when, when those ships were leaving the country and where what where the rot was and probably where they were headed. And Malta was running out of supplies, so the English had a fleet of about 20 ships that they were trying to uh, uh, go from the Suez Canal to Malta. They figured they would lose quite a few of them to Germans and uh, subs. But anyway, uh, they, Malta was so important to them and so desperate for supplies that they had this 20-ship convoy going to Malta. And the British intelligence got word that the uh, Italian fleet was coming out to intercept the uh, Malta expedition. So, uh, and the, our, uh, the, we were given the job of intercepting the Italian fleet before they intercepted the Malta, the English fleet going to Malta. And we were given, Malta was able to give us approximate coordinates where, where the fleet would be at a certain time. And uh, so we um, took off and um, intercepted, or try, were going to intercept the uh, Italian fleet. And we had uh, English observers in the nose with us each plane because they were afraid we might bomb the uh, English fleet rather than the Italian fleet. Ah, okay. And, uh, we did come pretty close to the English fleet, and the uh, flak was getting pretty close. And the, and the English observer says, "We better get away. That's it. the English troops. The Italians aren't that accurate." <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we went on, and we intercepted the Italian fleet before they were able to intercept the English fleet, and it consisted of a couple battleships and two or three cruisers and about eight or ten destroyers. And I can remember vividly about the battleships had on the decks were painted broad stripes of red and white. And I turned to my observer and said, why are those stripes? He said, well, the Italians had bombed their own fleet so much that they put those on so they wouldn't bomb them. <laughs> and, uh, I guess that's one way to keep your uh, sunk a cruiser and damaged the battleships so that the fleet turned back and went into their harbor at Taranto. And I don't believe the fleet ever came out in full force again during the war. I might be wrong on that, but I don't believe they did. So we did do some good, and the Malta, uh, the English fleet got to Malta. They lost some ships, but most of the supplies got through. And that was our second mission. From then on, we were bombing uh, Italian ports where the supplies were being sent to Ramos Africa Corps in Africa. And uh, Naples was a prime target. There were targets in Sicily that were hitting Palermo and Messina, of uh, uh, certain uh, ports in Greece where, that the Germans had taken over. Suda Bay was another one I remember, uh -huh. and uh, oh, quite a few of those. Um, and our targets mainly. Well, when I'm getting ahead of my story, when Rommel came so close to uh, uh, 
the Egyptian border, uh, I don't think the English stopped him as much as he ran out of, the, of supplies. And I think a large part of that was due to the bombing that we and other English uh, planes did on uh, supply, uh, supply ships coming from Europe to Africa. And uh, when Rommel got so close to uh, uh, Egypt, we uh, moved from the RAF base at Fayed, on, which was on the Suez Canal, up to a airdrome outside of uh, Tel Aviv at a little town called Lydda, L-Y-D-D-A, which was about seven miles out of, of uh, uh, Tel Aviv. And uh, I can remember uh, they, we were writing home and uh, they were censoring our letters, pretty sure, about location or anything. But one of the men in the outfit found a biblical passage that mentioned the town Lydda in it. So we were <laughs> writing to our family to look up in the Bible in a certain verse and that's all we said, and it passed the censors, and they knew where we were. Ah, but uh, I don't think we gave the Germans any information they didn't already know, because you're not going to hide 21 four-engine bombers from them. Correct. Uh, we had uh, three flights going over, Flight A, Flight B, and Flight C of seven planes each. And Jim Seibert was the flight commander of B Flight, and our our plane was named the Queen B. And uh, we, as I say, kept bombing uh, Tunis, Bizzardi, Palermo, Messino, and Crete, Sudave, and occasionally there would be a small convoy we, which would hit and all this information, or most of it, was coming from British intelligence, who was getting it from uh, Malta. And uh, uh, we only had seven-man crews, uh, navigator, bombardier, and we had a, two fixed guns in the nose and one that the navigator could operate a 50 caliber machine gun, but it was in a position that you hardly ever got a shot at them. But anyway, we had a seven man crew. We had pilot, co pilot, engineer who was also a side gunner, a, r a radio operator who operated the top turret of the guns, uh, engineering officer, and the other. Um, you know, it was the armor who managed the other uh, machine gun in the back and the tail gunner. So we had a seven man crew, and as the uh, gradually we would get a replacement crew, maybe every three or four weeks, and they would have at least eight or nine in their crews. In fact, uh, I think the last ones had ten man crews. Yes, my father had a ten-man crew. Ten man. Yes, when he got it, when he did, went he over. have a, a valley turret. Yes. Uh huh. And he had a he had a separate navigator and a separate bombardier. Yeah. And did I? Do you do you know which of uh, B twenty four he was flying? Which one? Uh, which, which uh, we were flying the B twenty four D. D. In, in dog. Yes. And yes. I think then the E's and. Maybe the F's were gone. Well, when he got over there, the the, the, the group was still flying uh, D's as in as in dog, but they had also started getting some H's and some J's, Henry and uh, Joe models. Yeah. So he flew I, all three variants. Yeah, I can barely hear you. Okay, I'll try to talk. Uh, oh, Wait. where was the? Uh, well, anyway, um, it was Halverson or how, uh, detachment, or how pro code word, from April of, April of 42 to uh, August of 42. Then in August of 42, it became the uh, first provisional bomb group, and that was till about November of 42, and then it, 
the 376 bomb group was formed in November, which the nucleus was the HALPRO and then uh, replacement crews that came from time to time. Right. Can, can you hear me now? The original, I figured out the original 21 planes that we lost seven crews during that almost year we were over there. And uh, uh, our pilots and our maintenance men were so good that we never lost a crew in landing, takeoff, or training, or anything. And I can think of three accidents that the uh, uh, replacement crews had. Uh, one of them was uh, we used to drop down close to the Mediterranean to set our altimeter, and it's a little hard to judge your heights over water. And one of the replacement crews crashed into the metro Mediterranean. They were all lost. Another one was uh, coming in on, from a night bombing mission and undershot the field and hit some buildings, and uh, they were killed. And the third one was that, uh, I think, June the 4th mission in Ju uh, June of 43, where that plane was on a bombing mission and uh, flying out of Soluk, which was a little below uh, Benghazi. And uh, they overshot the field, and I think they ended up crashing 300 miles into the desert, and they were found by an oil crew some 25 years later. That was, that was the airplane Lady Be Good. Yes, and I was on that mission. I think it was June, June uh, 4th. It was, a it was April 4th. Or, wait, no, April 4th. I beg your pardon. Yes. I was on that mission, and I don't remember any navigation problems on that flight. Yes, I know a couple of other, I've met a couple of other veterans who were also on that flight, and they've made the same observation. Yeah, in fact, I think I was able to pick up the coastline So uh, just by sight. Now, this, that, the, the crew of Lady Be Good, that was their very first mission. Uh huh. So they may not have been as familiar. But yes. anyway, I would have thought they might have, you know, tried to fly as close to the other airplanes as possible. They might have had some kind of radio signal or homing in on that and passed over it and didn't realize they did. And they kept going. But you would think after they went 100 miles or so past it, they would have known. You would have. One would have thought so. Yes. Now, well, you. I can barely hear you. Okay, I'll try to talk a little louder. Uh, you yes, might... it might. I'm sorry? Now, uh, oh, I, I want to tell you about one mission that uh, I, I really had some influence on two missions. One of them was the uh, one on Ploesti when we didn't bomb the railroad yards, and another one was when we were shot down, and I'll explain that, that was a uh, mission, uh, our first trip uh, from, uh, oh, well, I'm getting a little ahead of my story, after four months and the victory at El Alamein, and the British 8th Army started pushing Rommel's troops back, we moved back to an RAF base on the Suez Canal called Abu Swar, ABU and S something, I've forgotten how you spell the last part. Right. And we were flying out of the RAF base. And uh, our, about the first mission after we moved back to Abiswire was to bomb Tripoli. We'd never hit Tripoli before. It was a pretty long flight, about, I guess, four and a half hours to get to the target. And uh, so... We had, uh, I think, a nine-plane formation. By that time, Jim Seibert had gone to uh, uh, take a pilot's place that was uh, flying uh, uh, Colonel Halverson around. Uh, he had had a pilot uh, who had been with KLM Airlines before. Is that Calbera? He went back to headquarters in Cairo. His name was Calbera. 
And uh, so they selected Jim Seibert to be their pilot, and our crew got a new pilot who was went over as a co-pilot. With his name was John Wilcox, and I believe he flew with a uh, Captain Wilkinson or Lieutenant Wilkinson. But anyway, he was a good pilot too, and he was our first mission uh, when he took over the crew was to bomb Tripoli. So we went uh, across near uh, south of Benghazi and went out to the Bay of whatever that bay is, the Bay of Libya or something, and we're going to approach the uh, Tripoli from the Mediterranean. Yes. And once again, the weather ruined it. Uh, about 50 miles away from Tripoli, completely socked in, and all the planes... Uh, started jettisoning their bombs because they didn't want to take them back. And I came up with the bright idea to Wilcox that we uh, were, were flying back the same route that we did, which was about 30 or 40 miles south of Benghazi. And I knew there was a supply dump just uh, not far off our course, maybe 5 to 10 miles. I said, why don't we save our bombs and we haven't had any serious fighter opposition. Why don't we save our bombs and pull out a formation and bomb this supply dump? And he thought it was a good idea. So we, as we crossed the uh, coast to uh, get into uh, the Libyan desert again, uh, we we left. The, we were the. We had three. Plane formations of uh, uh, nine in the total flight, and we were tail end Charlie on the uh, uh, one of the two back flights. So we pulled out a formation, went, dropped our bombs, started the fires according to the tail gunner, and tried to get back into formation. And all at once, we were jumped by five Messerschmitt 109s. We'd never had uh, Messerschmitt 109s before, and uh, British intelligence hadn't said anything about Messerschmitt 109s being there. But we found out later that it was uh, Hermann Goering's pet squadron who had sent that down to help Rommel uh, in, in his retreat. And they dove at us the first time, five of them, I can remember them vividly. They were dark color with yellow air screws. And uh, we were the first attack. They knocked out one engine and hit the prop governor on another. So we had two good engine and a third engine running at about half speed. And... Uh, they came at us again and uh, knocked out another engine. And I, I knew if they made a third attack, it would be we would be go down in flames. I've never been so scared in my life. I even had cotton in my mouth. I understand that's characteristic of and. Uh, Luckily, they didn't make a third dive. I don't know why, whether they were short of supplies or what. We could see our formation up ahead of us, but we couldn't get to it. And I don't know whether we were attacked, but anyway, you couldn't risk the rest of the formation to come back and help us. So after the Messerschmitt 109s broke off, we were losing altitude about 200 feet a minute. And both the good engine and the half engine were on the same side, which which made it awfully hard to fly. And John Wilcox did a real good job of flying that. And there the question came up, do we parachute out or do we crash land? And the tail gunner had gotten a bad wound in his neck and shoulder from a 20-millimeter cannon uh, that the Messerschmitts were equipped with. And uh, we decided that there's no way that he could bail out and try to 
walk any place, so we stuck with the plane and we're going to crash and crash landed it. And the land in the Libyan desert, most of it is like land in Tucson, Arizona, or, or New Mexico, or someplace. And we decided the land wheels up crash land because we weren't sure about the hydraulic system, whether the Germans had knocked that out or anything, or tires uh, flat or something, and afraid by crash landing, maybe we could avoid a fire. And again, John Wilcox did a wonderful job. He crash landed the plane and was able to keep it steady. And I can remember it was just about sundown, and all the dust and dirt, and dirt from the crash landing was coming up, and the sun rays were coming through, and it looked like it was on fire for a while, but it wasn't. And we came to an abrupt stop. Nobody was hurt except the tail gunner had the bad wound in his neck and shoulder, and the co-pilot had gotten a, a crease uh, across his forehead. It, Maybe drew a little blood, but that was all it was. So we were most fortunate. And I can remember uh, a few years later reading the book For Whom the Bells Told by Ernest uh, Hemingway. And I remember the hero in the, in the book had planted the bomb in the bridge and had to ride back to a ravine with enemy soldiers firing at him from both sides, and he used the expression, he was so afraid he had cotton in his mouth. And I know, knew then that Ernest Hemingway had been in a tight predicament because he wouldn't have thought up that stuff. But anyway, that's just a sidelight. Uh, from then on, uh, we were given about three weeks off, a tail gunner, uh, uh, survived, and uh, well, I'm ahead of my story. The next day, a uh, British fighter plane came over, uh, an old Hurricane fighter plane, and tipped their wings to acknowledging that he saw us, and he went back, and a few hours later, a Lockheed Hudson came and was able to land and picked us up and took us back to the air base at Abushwar. So that was a big experience. I, I still remember it vividly, but I've never had any nightmares or anything from it. But why we weren't killed and why there wasn't a third German attack, I'll never know. One of, one of the mysteries of war, I guess. <laughs> yes. I think it, uh, they must have been either short of ammunition or short of gasoline or something. Because yeah. they could see we were in trouble. I, I assume that you, yeah. the, the crew was firing back at them. Yeah. Uh, well, and let's see. We were given about three weeks off from that, and I, uh, uh, and three days in Tel Aviv as Tel Aviv as a rest. And from then on, we, uh, the crew broke up, and I flew some with. Uh, uh, Ted Crouchley was a pilot that I flew with some and a uh, couple other pilots and uh, I can't think of his other names. Fred Wilma? Fred Milam? Yeah, Milam was the uh, uh, last few missions that I flew. And uh, uh, he was. I was fortunate to have good pilots. And the last couple of missions... They had uh, some uh, younger uh, crews going with us, and so, uh, I mean, a uh, uh, younger navigator or bombardier or something, so I uh, sort of took it easy and flew as a bombardier the last couple of missions because there wasn't any work except about five minutes over the target. Huh. So, and then we... Flew uh, that gave me that last mission 
uh, 305 combat hours, and you had to have 300 to come back. And uh, so we <coughs> had an Air Force plane to Af the coast of Africa, and they didn't have any other planes going uh, west, so we flew back uh, Panama Clipper, which had bunk beds in it and everything. It was really nice. And I remember the pilot, as he was crossing the Atlantic, he thought he saw a, a German U-boat down in the water, and he went buzzed down to look at it. I remember going up the pilot, for Christ's sake, get, get out of here. I don't want to have completed 305 combat hours and get shot down by a German U-boat. <laughs> yeah, well, so, especially since you didn't have any guns or bombs to shoot back. Yeah, and... Uh, one other kind of amusing thing, uh, Colonel Halverson, uh, the men loved him. He somehow got us on per diem for four or five months when we were uh, in the RAF bases. That was $6 a day. And when we were in uh, uh, Tel Aviv, when we weren't flying, we could go into Tel Aviv. And it was a modern... Uh, almost a modern American city. But for that $6 a day, you could get a steak dinner for $2, and you could uh, drink good scotch or bourbon were 50 cents each, so our per diem were paid for our social activities. Well, wow, you had a good old time. Robertson, oh, the group really loved him. And... Uh, I remember one time being in a nightclub, and one of the entertainers came over, a girl, and sat at the table and said how nice Colonel Halverson was that he had given her a gift. And and she said, would you like to see it? And she was opening her pocketbook, and I thought, I wonder how he got nylons or something like that. And it turned out to be a cake of ivory soap. <laughs> so... The next morning, I had a little PX had a run on ivory soap. <laughs> <laughs> so that's another amusing thing. Now, uh, I can barely hear you, but I'm open to any question you might want to ask me. Okay, I have a couple of questions based on some, uh, some of the comments you made. Can you hear me? Uh, hardly. Okay, uh, first of all, do you have a picture of, of Jim Cypher's crew with you in it? Do I have what? A picture of your original crew with Mr. Seifert. No, I don't. I wish I did. Incidentally, I talked to Jim Seifert a couple nights ago, and he can tell you more about 376 than I could, and I have his phone number if you want to call him. Absolutely. All right. His number is 239-454-2. Eight four eight. That's two three. In, in, in. Oh, incidentally, after he get, got out of the Air Force in, uh, I think around 1945, he joined the FBI and got up pretty high in the FBI and was one of the two agents, FBI agents, to meet Kennedy's plane when it came back from uh, Dallas. Really? And uh, he was. I've. We kept in touch. I've seen him, oh, four or five times in the last 20 years and talked to him some. And I did call him a couple of nights ago and ask him several questions that I had. And uh, I told him that I would, uh, did he mind if I gave you his number? And he said, oh, no, he'd be glad to answer any questions that he might have had. Well, I will try to arrange a uh, telephone conversation with him. Yeah, I, I just can't hear you. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll try to talk a little louder. Um, you were there when the B-17 came with uh, General Brereton? Can you hear me? I'm hearing you a little better now. Okay, you were there when the B-17s arrived from India with General Brereton? Yes, and he was not our favorite. He made the statement, my whole Air Force is expendable, and we didn't think we were. 
That must have gone over good. Yeah, it did. Oh, I do want to, let's see. Oh, as a result of our uh, uh, being shot down in the desert behind, technically we were behind German lines, but it was um, 70 miles or so south of the Mediterranean, so it was only an occasional per patrol that came down there. And uh, we became eligible for the RAF club called the Late Arrivals Club. And uh, their uh, stipulation is that you come back to your base uh, long after your estimated time of arrival return. And if you were in enemy territory, and we were able to ask to join that, and the motto is, uh, it's never too late to return, and the uh, the emblem is a little silver boot about the size of a quarter that you could wear on your flight jacket. Uh, I didn't wear it in the States because I was afraid some uh, brass who had never been in combat would say I was out of uniform, so I never did. Huh. Interesting. Yeah. What... You you mentioned uh, that Halverson was was uh, much liked by the by the crew. What 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 did you think when Halverson was relieved of command? We were sorry. I think uh, did K K Compton come in next? I think uh, McGuire took over for a while. Oh, he was a West Pointer, and we had three flight leaders: uh, John Payne and Dick Sanders and McGuire, and we much preferred uh, John Payne and Dick Sanders. In fact, Sanders, when I first saw him at Fort Myers, was a first lieutenant. A year later, he was a brigadier general. Yes, I believe he became the youngest brigadier general in the uh, Army Air Corps. Yeah, he probably was. He was a good man. And John Payne was a Texan that a typical Texan, he was, you felt safe when he was leading the flight. And do you know that on one mission where they only, I don't know whether they only figured they needed four B-24s or maybe that was all they could get in the air at that time, but he was flying over, I think it was Naples, and one Italian fighter uh, knocked down two of our B-24s, and John Payne was one of them. Yes, um, I remember reading that. There was uh, a sad day in the group. Oh, that was a, that was our lowest morale, and uh, they named an airdrome after him near Cairo called Payne Field. And I don't know whether that field is still operating or or what. <clears throat> But he was a real good man. I heard a story about him that uh, he named his plane Black Mariah. Yeah. And that it was named after his car. Oh. I, uh, he was from Austin, Texas, I mean, I mm. remember. And uh, a typical Texan. <laughs> yes. Um, another question I had with, uh, going back to your training, you said you got to Fort Myers in April of 1942. Yes. When did you? Uh, when were you assigned to Jim Seifert's crew, or how did the crews form, or what was the? How did how did that process take place? Well, I think uh, Jim Seifert. I graduated first in my navigation class. I was good at mathematics, and there's some math involved in celestial navigation. But the main reason I think was I had two roommates that were struggling, and I helped them a lot, and I think you learned a lot by trying to teach something. And uh, so I, got, I graduated first in my class, and Jim, being the leader of B-Flight, got his pick, so he picked me because I had the good grades. Ah, that sounds good. Yeah. Now, when then when you went to uh, Eglin to, to train on your bombing? Yes. Did Cypher go with you, or did you just... No, no uh, some uh, one of the pilots flew us over. We were only there about three or four days, and then they 
uh, somebody came over and flew us back. So did then after you rejoined the crew, did you guys practice bombing runs out over the Atlantic or anything? No, we didn't. And I remember uh, when I was uh, operating the link trainer down at Eglin Field, General Arnold came up. I don't know whether this project was a uh, between he and Colonel. Uh, I, I I don't know whether it was his uh, project or uh, whether he and Colonel Halverson were good friends. And uh, anyway, I had just finished a bombing run and scored a hit on the plumb bomb, and uh, General Arnold said, good work, son, or something like that. But I don't know whether he was down there specially to see us or whether he happened to be, I'm inclined to think he was, making a tour of the air bases and just happened to be there at that time. Well, you were asking the question about uh, the relationship between uh, General Arnold and Colonel Halverson. Yes. I, I did some research uh, back in Jan about the events in January of 1942, so that would be like three months before your group was formed, and Franklin, President Roosevelt had asked uh, Marshall, George Marshall, and therefore, Hap Arnold, uh, how could we bomb Japan oh. after the Pearl Harbor raid? Yeah. And uh, apparently, Arnold asked his uh, planning team for some ideas. And the only, at that time, the only bomber that they had was was the B-24 that could reach Japan. Uh -huh. And uh, and, Ar and Arnold said, well. Where do we fly the B-24 out of? And they said, well, you could do Alaska or Russia or China. And the Russians weren't at war with Japan, so they, the Russians wouldn't let us fly out. And I think Alaska was too quite was a little bit too far. We never would have would have been a one-way mission. Yeah. And so it was basically China. Uh -huh. Well, so Howerson was picked because he had done some exper some uh, work on uh, fuel efficiency. And uh, Halverson had been on the, the Around the World flight that took place in the 1920s. Oh, and that's remember. probably how Arnold knew him. Yeah. And so anyway, so Halverson was put in charge of, of planning the, the, the mission from China. Well, <clears throat> in the meanwhile, of course, the Doolittle raid got planned. Yeah. And uh, do, do you remember Scott Royce? Yes. Well, he, he's alive. He's an officer. Yes, and he, I've talked with him, and he told me that uh, he was kind of selected like you were. In other words, that he got, to, he was one of the cream of the crop, and he arrived in the pen, or not in the Pentagon, but he arrived at the War Department, and, and Colonel uh, Doolittle's office and Colonel Helveson's office were right next to each other. Oh. Uh -huh. And Roy, Royce was given this option: Do you want to fly with Doolittle, or do you want to fly with Halverson? And so he picked Halverson. Yeah. Uh, the Halverson mission was going to be, you know, since the B-24 could could fly back to its base, it was going to be the beginning of a, it was the C group of a, of a, a B-24 group that was supposed to, you know, fly, keep flying missions in China. Yeah. And then, like you said, by the time you guys got over to Africa, the base had been overrun. Yeah. Um, and, and if so, you talk to Jim Seibert, tell him that, he because he knew Colonel Halverson very well. In fact, he flew him for a while, and uh, I remember, uh, let's see, oh, just before we took off for Africa, we were briefed by an English uh, officer, and he said they'd, this was a little bit disconcerting, he said they'd had a uh, squadron of B-24s in Java, but they never found out how they did in combat because the ones they sent out, none of them ever came back. Wow. That was, that was a little bit disconcerting. Well, when you, uh, you were asking me about my father, my father arrived in uh, January of 1944, and he was assigned to the 512th Squadron. Oh, I was in the 515th, yeah. yeah. Well, on and, and the December 28th, all the planes of the 512th Squadron were shot down. All of them. All of them. Oh. So when he arrived, uh, 
at the squadron, there were no planes and no crews. And when they asked, you know, the the ground crews, well, where is everybody? They said they never came back. Gee, that was, so that, that would be just as disconcerting, I would think. Yes. Yeah, that would really <laughs> give you some thought. Yes. Um, but in any event, um, I'm trying to go through my notes here. Um, did you fly any missions with the B-17s, or did you meet no, with... No, I didn't. I've flown... The B-17s got all the publicity because of the movie and something else, but actually I understand they made 17,000 B-24s and 14,000 B-17s. Yes, they made more B-24s. And And the B-24 was a lot better where they had sandstorms or dirt or something. They had the Pratt & Whitney engines, and they could take it better than, I believe, the uh, B-17s. Did they have a right engine or? Uh, I believe the, they had the right cyclone. Yeah. And the, um, uh, the, but, the B, but the B-17 could fly higher. Yeah. But the B-24 flew faster and carried more bombs. Yeah. It was a tough plane, I'll tell you. So, so you never did, – did you meet any of the crews of the B-17 guys or talk to any of them at all? Did you no, fly out? I didn't, but we had uh, – one of our crews, I think, went to India – uh, Adams was the pilot, and Kirk Caldy was the nav. We only had three seasoned navigators. Uh, Bernie Rang, who was maybe a top aerial navigator in the country, or pretty close to it, and a man by the name of Kirk Caldy, and another one by Smith. And the rest of us were just out of navigation school. Yes. Uh, and this Bernie Rang. Uh, happened to be in Cairo on some business, and there was a, a new crew that was going to was bombing Messina, and he volunteered to go along, and they were attacked by uh, fighter planes, and uh, fire was started in one engine, and the pilot said they could bail out, and he and the navigator bailed out, and they got the fire out, and the plane returned, but they never heard from Ranger the... Other a navigator again, really? Yeah, that was. Do you know if they be, were they ever were they captured or did they become I, POWs? I, I'm inclined to. Jim Seibert thought they were maybe out some ways uh, sea from Messina or some place, and that uh, maybe they drowned or something. Really? But I, I, there's no record of them being uh, prisoners of war or anything. That, you said that was a mission to Messina? I believe it was. Okay. Do you remember the name of the pilot on that mission? No, I don't. Okay. okay. Uh, Jim Seibert might know that. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> trying to think of anything else. Uh, do you have any other uh, pictures of, of any of the airplanes or any of the other crews or any of the other people you flew missions with? No, I don't. The only picture I have is a picture, and it's kind of faded, of our tail gunner, and I don't know why I got that. Is that Filippi? Yeah, Anthony Filippi. He was the one that was injured, right, in the neck? Yes. He got back in the States, and I heard that maybe he joined a B-29 group, but I don't know if that's true. Jim Seibert, I think, told me that. Okay. Uh, now, what did you do after you got back, after you flew your missions? Uh, my father was a Buick dealer, one of the one of the first agencies in the country. Uh, Buicks came out in 1903, and he became a dealer in 1916, a year before I was born. And uh, so when I got out of the service, uh, I went in business with him, and he died in 1960, and I took over the agency, and I sold it some years later. Ah. So what? Uh, uh, did, how how long were you in the service before? Did, uh, uh, almost five. Well, four years and some months. So you got out after the war ended. Yes. In fact, I got out on a technicality right after uh, they had bomb uh, atomic bomb fell on Japan. They came out with a directive that anybody who had been shot down and evaded capture could apply for a discharge. So I got out two or three months earlier than 
and I would have, but I was anxious to get back home. And <laughs> sure. Uh, so I got out about, I think, uh, July of 45, and I had enough that with my terminal leave, it was put it up to around November or something. Now, what did you... What did you do between the uh, the time you re well? I guess I should ask when when did you fly back to the states after your three hundred and five combat hours? Was that in well, April? Yes, a, um, well, we landed in New York the day the Allies took Tunis and Bizerte, and I think that was May fifth, sixth, seventh, along in there. A forty-three. Yes. And so, what did you do between May of forty-three and July of? 45 when you, when they let you out. Uh, I went to um, navigation school, went to bombardeering school. Well, first when I uh, when we landed in New York, uh, uh, Rob, Bob Helms, who was a navigator bombardier, was on the same flight with me, and we flew back KLM. I mean, not um, the uh, Pan American, and we landed in New York. At uh, near Mitchell Field, and Scotty Royce's father was a general, and I think he was in maybe at that time in charge of of uh, Mitchell Field. But anyway, I remember talking to him, and he's asking about Scotty, and and uh, he said, "What do you plan on doing?" And we said, "We're probably instructing." And he said, where would you like to instruct? And I thought, oh, I wonder if he's going to use his influence. I said, any place east of the Mississippi. And where did I end up? In Tucson, Arizona. So you asked to be east of the Mississippi, and they sent you almost to the Pacific Ocean. Right. But that, uh, that was uh, another lucky break that I had because I was there about a year and a half, and I met this. A senior at the University of Virginia, uh, University of Arizona, uh, in March of '45. I'd been there a year and a half, and I met her and liked her very much. And we dated for three months. She graduated in June, and we were married June 23rd. And we've been married for it'll be 63 years on June 23rd. Oh, well, so if I'd been, <laughs> if I'd been sent to east of the Mississippi, I never would have met her. Never would have met her. Well, that, how, that's pretty fortunate. Yes, it was. So you became an instructor? Yes, at, uh, at uh, Davis Mountain Field in Tucson, which was really uh, a nice air base. And uh, we were, for a while there, we were instructing on, we had what they call the CNT Towers, Celestial Navigation Towers. And they looked a lot like a barn silo, but what it was was a revolving dome in the top part, and you were flying a link trainer below the dome, and they could actually plot uh, a mission for you, and you would use your uh, uh, instrument. Uh, it's not a sextant. I've forgotten what to call it. Uh, What it was. Uh, anyway, they used instead of a leveler uh, with a sextant, you can use the uh, uh, C as a level. Right. And, uh, and the uh, octant, that's the name I the octant. think of. That uses a bubble, a bubble for a leveler because a plane is so, uh, doesn't fly real steady. And if you took enough shots with that bubble as near the center as you could get it, it would average out pretty good. Uh-huh. Well, my dad went through uh, Davis Monson, so... Did he? So you may have met, or his navigator, but um, a lot of the guys who uh, ended up in the 376 went through Davis Monson. Oh, did he like that base? I, I thought it was a great base. He, My dad never talked about his exploits. I, I found out much about what happened after he had died because oh. I went that, that that's when I got his records uh -huh. um, so uh, he never really said much about about it so um, 
But anyway, so you were at Davis Monson basically the whole time after you uh, yes, came, came back. Uh-huh. Except okay. for going to the uh, the CNT, Celestial Navigation Training School, was uh, outside of Chanute Field uh, near the Un- University of Illinois. Uh-huh. And uh, I took that course for about six weeks before I went to Davis Monson. Oh. No, I was born in Champaign. Oh, were you? Yes, my so father. My familiar with that. Then. Well, I left when I was three months old. I don't remember much. My my, my father was from Illinois, and, and he went to the University of Illinois under the GI Bill. Oh. So uh, he had met my mother. He was he he was at Mountain Home in Idaho, uh-huh. and he met my mother on a U. She was doing a USO show, so oh. they got married, and then he he went back to Illinois, and then. And then my mom convinced him to to go to school on the GI Bill, and the rest, as they say, is history. Yeah, I wish I could. Uh, I have four years of college, but I don't have a degree. Uh, I didn't fail any courses, but I transferred from Randolph Macon College, which is a small college, to the University of Virginia in the fourth, and I needed only a couple of credits. But when I got out of the service, went in business with my father. His Health was turning bad, so I had to stay there. Huh. Well, the this year's reunion is going to be in Washington D.C. Have you given any thought to going to it? Um, I I have. Uh, I, I'm not in the best of physical health. I have trouble getting out of a chair, and I can still drive my car pretty good, I think, because. Uh, I was driving uh, cars around my father's lot when he was eleven when I was eleven or twelve years old. So huh. it comes naturally, but uh, I, I would like to make the first appearance and maybe the uh, final dinner. I don't know. Now, how far do you live from Washington D.C.? Uh, about sixty miles. Ah, uh, Winchester is in the northern end of the Shenandoah Valley, and. Uh, a lot of the Civil War was fought around Winchester, and Stonewall Jackson's headquarters were here for a while. And uh, they historians have estimated that Winchester changed hands 72 times during the war. 72? Sometimes two or three times a, a, a day. And it made me think of Tobruk, which... Uh, Half the time is in British control, and the other half is in German control, and they took turns back and forth. I don't think they changed hands 72 times, but it made me think of Winchester when I was thinking about Tober. Well, that that was a lot. Yeah. Um, I'm starting to run out of things. I was There are still some HALPRO members who are uh, still active in the... Uh, Association. Uh, did you know Albert Story? Story. No. He was part of Ed Cave's crew. That was a crew, I think, that was interned in Turkey. Oh, I f- forgot to tell you, did I, about the uh, when we flew back from uh, Ploesti? It was a long flight, and we didn't we knew we didn't have enough gas to get back to uh, Fayed on the Suez Canal. Uh-huh. And they gave us three choices, Tiflis, Russia, or Syria, which was pretty far, Aleppo, which is near Damascus, or in a pinch, land in Turkey, and the British can get you out in about 10 days, although Turkey is neutral. Well, four of our crews went into Turkey. Right. And instead of taking getting out in 10 days, I think it was about six months. Yes. So when they finally got them out, the rest of us had 150, close to 200 combat hours, and they were starting almost from scratch. Right. So that was fortunate. So you did, did you guys land in, uh, you said you were, did you? so you didn't make it back to base no, that night? No, no plane made it. I don't think any planes made it back to Fayette. So where did you land? In uh, Aleppo, Syria. Okay. Refueled? Uh, yes. Uh, what we did, uh, we were running short of gas. We were in the Mediterranean going into 
Syria, and uh, we were aiming for Aleppo, and we saw this aerodrome down below us about 15 miles from the coast, and we uh, dropped down, and there were oil drums all over the field. And uh, Jim Seibert said, I wonder what's why they've closed this airport. And then I happened to check my notes and said, Jim, we should have gone about 20 more miles. <laughs> and so we went 20 more miles and came to Aleppo and landed with about 15 minutes gas supply. So, now, when you when you uh, flew the mission, did you see any of the other planes, or were you in contact with any other planes? No, or was it, it was, uh, we took off at, in the middle of the night on, uh, it flew over Turkey, which we weren't supposed to do, and went into the Black Sea. And I remember shooting lines on the North Star because that's the easiest star, and although it's not the brightest, the uh -huh. easiest one to use in navigation because you don't have to make much of a correction on it. And uh, we went up till we got to right angles, or it would be left angle to uh, uh, Ploesti and turned left. And we were headed right for Ploesti until we ran into that uh, uh, weather front. So you never saw any of the other planes or talked to them? Never saw any of them. Huh, interesting. Um, and then would you do, was that a RAF base there at Aleppo? Uh, no, it was. Uh, I don't know, really, although we refilled, so it, I don't know whether it's an RAF base or not. But, but you, anyway, refueled and returned the next day? Yes. Mm -hmm. We spent the night there. Uh-huh. So the other, some of the other people that I know, uh, Al Izzo, I I'm trying to remember whose crew he was with. He was a tail gunner. And Wilbur West, Wilbur, Wilbur was West. also uh, interned in Turkey. And that is a familiar name. Uh, four crews were interned there. Right. In fact, I think they even had pictures of them in Life magazine or something. In fact, I, I have, have copies of those pictures, but yes, you're correct. Yeah. They were uh, the U.S. ambassador to Turkey. Uh, I forget his name, but anyway, he apparently uh, held several, like, July 4th parties and Christmas parties for uh, those, those men. Were they in there as, long, as far as Christmas? Were they well, they, they didn't get out until May of 43. Oh, is that? No. I well, I, West, West was one of the crew. They, they actually stole one of the B-24s, one of their own B-24s, and flew it to Crete. Oh. They did that in December. Uh-huh. So those guys got out early. Yeah, well, that's, yeah. And yeah. Uh, what they had done, it was kind of sneaky. They... Uh, the Turks didn't know how to operate or maintain the B-24, and so uh, Wes and some of the guys uh, volunteered to, quote, maintain the airplane. Yeah. And so they slowly uh, would get gasoline because they'd have to run the engines, but they wouldn't burn up all the fuel, and they slowly filled up the fuel tank oh. in one of the B-24s. Uh -huh. And then um, one of them had, like, a Cracker Jacks compass. Yeah. And that's all he had, other than what was on the airplane. Yeah. And uh, the Turks had taken all the machine guns and bullets out of the plane, obviously. Uh -huh. And so uh, one day they went out, the whole crew went out to maintain the airplane, and uh, the Turks only had like one or two guards on the airplane. And they, they sent one of the guards back into the, into the hangar to get something. And uh, I forget the name of the pilot. Anyway, Wes was the co-pilot. They revved the engines up, taxied to the end of the runway, and took off. Oh, man. And the pilot said, okay, where to now? And somebody said, well, Crete's, Crete's basically west. <laughs> Let's head or south or wherever. <laughs> and they just flew, and then um, using this little Cracker Jacks compass, and they got there, and um, the RAF saw this plane coming in. They scrambled some Spitfires or Hurricanes or something, and... Um, Saw the plane coming in. Uh, I don't know if they had U.S. markings or if they'd repainted it in the Turkish markings, but uh, they escorted the plane in uh, and landed, and that was it. I wonder if Jim Seibert knows that. If you talk to him, tell him that. Okay. Uh, I, that's completely new to me. So they, they in fact, the Turks 
were kind of angry and wanted the, the United States to return the plane because oh. because Turkey was neutral. Yeah, and uh, they they weren't exactly prisoners of war, but they weren't you know free to. I guess it was like Switzerland and Sweden. They weren't they were free to kind of stay there, but they weren't free to yeah. to escape. I believe in the First World War they were with Germany. Weren't they? Yeah, Turkey was on the other side. Yeah. And I think that's kind of why Turkey didn't choose sides uh, yeah. the second time around. Um, well, I can't think of anything else. I can't either. I've certainly enjoyed this. Uh, well, I believe me, I was pleasure was all mine. Did you get you got my uh, Jim Scheibert's telephone number? Yes. Okay. I'll repeat it. It's two three nine four five four one eight four eight. That's correct. Uh-huh. It's a retirement home. Uh, he, uh, I think it's one of those where you maybe they do your. I was going to say snow removal, but I don't think you do that in Florida. What, what part of the country does he live in? Uh, in uh, Fort Myers, Florida. Oh, he, that's in Florida. Okay. Yeah, he went back to Fort Myers when he oh. retired from the FBI. That's where you trained. Yeah, and his wife died, uh, I believe, in uh, December forty-five, uh, December oh five. Oh five. Okay. Yeah. Well, I will uh, definitely try to give uh, Mr. Cypher a call. All right, and. Um, I'm sure I'll be in contact, and um, I would love to meet you if you could get to the reunion. Are you planning on being there? I'm planning on being there. I will try to make it, depending on my condition, and my wife has a little trouble, too. She said two hip replacements and one knee replacement. Oh, my God. She doesn't get along around too well. My mother-in-law had a had a knee replacement, and it's uh, it's difficult you know. Yeah, the rehab on the knee was worse than the hips. That's right. why she hadn't had the other knee done because the rehab was so rough. Right. Yeah. Well, maybe wait, I'll rent a car or something if you don't make it. Maybe drive up to and talk with you there or something. Uh, I wish you would. And be uh, glad to see you. Okay. Do you have anything else to add, Rob? Not. I'm sure I'll think of things, but right now I can't. Okay. Okay, well, Ed, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Okay, I got all that. So we're in good shape. That sounds great. Well, Mr. Ebert, I really appreciate it, and um, I'll stay in touch, and um, we'll we'll go from there. All right, good. Okay, Rob, you want to hang on for a second? Enjoy this talk. I sure will. Okay, well, well, thanks for talking. Bye, Mr. Ebert. Thank you. Thank you all. Okay, bye. Goodbye. I'm going to go ahead and go back to the regular phone, Ed. Are you there? Okay. Yep, I got all that. So why he couldn't...